of meeting. Notice of the time and place of this meeting was publicized by notifying the area news media, by publicizing the same in the Omaha World Herald and outlets, by displaying such notice on the arcade level of Energy Plaza since July 5, 2013, and by mailing such notice to each of the district's directors on that same date. A copy of the proposed agenda for this meeting has been maintained on a current basis and is readily available for public inspection in the office of the district's corporate secretary. Additionally, a copy of the open meetings law is available for inspection in the public meeting book located in this meeting room. Item number three, review of the May 2013 comprehensive financial and operating reports and approval of the minutes and the excused absence of Director Ulrich for the last meeting. So moved. Second. Call the roll, please. Barrett. Yes. Gay. Yes. Green. Yes. McGuire. Yes. Mines. Yes. Ulrich. Abstain. Weber. Yes. Motion carried. Item number four. Persons wishing to address the board of directors on a particular item are asked to approach the microphone as that agenda item is discussed. <coughs> Comments will be heard following the board discussion of the item and prior to a vote by the board. 
Persons wishing to address the board on all other matters will have, it, will have an opportunity before the close of the meeting. At this time, I'd like to briefly review the guidelines for public participation that were voted in place at the June board meeting. Any member of the public addressing the board shall state his or her name and address, the name of any organization or person he or she is representing, and whether he or she desires to submit any written comments or other materials to the board. All such written materials shall be received on behalf of the board by the individual designated by the chairperson. The chair chairperson may at any time direct that specific questions or comments addressed to the speaker, addressed by the speaker to the board, or to any mem member of the board, or to any other representative of the district, be, res be responded to by the chairperson or by another member of the board, or by any other representative representative of the district or that the matter be taken under advisement and speakers shall refrain from polling the board as such a vote is not on the agenda and is prohibited by law. Speakers, please limit your comments to three minutes per matter pending. Try not to repeat what other speakers have said. If part of the group, please designate a spokesperson for the group and vulgar, threatening, and provocative or slanderous speech will not be tolerated. And finally, the chairperson may at any time limit or extend the amount of time a speaker has to comment or make further comment with respect to any matter for any meeting. The chairperson may also limit the total amount of time for which the board will receive public comment with respect to any matter for, or for any meeting. Item number five, resolution number 5965. <clears throat> Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power <coughs> District as follows, that the engineer certification requesting that the board waive the sealed bid requirements in accordance with Nebraska Revised Statute 70-637 as amended is hereby approved. That the district is hereby authorized to negotiate and enter, enter into a contract or contracts for the engineering, procurement, and shipping of the spent fuel pool level instrumentation for the Fort Calhoun station, subject to review and approval of the final contract documents by the district's general counsel. And three, that the notice required by Nebraska Revised Statute Section 70-637 as amended shall be published in the Omaha World Herald. So, yeah. Second. Director McGuire, please. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, an upgrade to the uh, spent fuel pool level instrumentation is uh, required uh, because of a Nuclear Regulatory Commission order. Uh, the NRC uh, Commission order requires two independent spent fuel pool level instrument systems uh, to be installed in the Fort Calhoun spent fuel pool to be operable during various postulated events. Uh, this is to create a redundancy and I increase the safety uh, even further than what it is right now. It is safe at this time, obviously. Um, the Fort Calhoun uh, submitted back in uh, February 2013 the overall integrated plan, and it was endorsed by the NRC, and now we're ready to go out and uh, purchase this instrumentation. Uh, the contracts are going to be purchased uh, for the services, for the instrumentation and services only, and there's going to be a second contract that we're going to have as far as the, uh, actually the, uh, installation of the uh, spent fuel instrumentation. That's going to come at a, at a, at a later time. Uh, as I said, this is going to be going in in 2015 is when it's going to be happening, so we need a, a long time as far as preparing for this. Uh, it's very uh, complex uh, procurement and engineering for this. is a very complex situation. Uh, it has to be uh, exacting technical specifications for proper systems, operation, interface, control, and reliability. And uh, due to this uh, technologically complex and unique nature, uh, bidding, sealed bidding processes are really impractical in this situation and not in the public's best interest. Uh, the estimated uh, value of the contract associated with this work is $713,000. And now I'm going to ask Mr. Kornopasi, if you could sort of uh, give us a little framework. Uh, does this, how much does this relate to Fukushima as far as, and as far as the safety, present safety now of our spent fuel pool, and then uh, how this relates to Fukushima? Yeah, as, as mentioned, as you mentioned at the outset, it is part of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission order, so it's directly associated with the Lessons Learned Task Force uh, with Fukushima. 
And, uh, and again, the, the 2015 commitment, uh, we'll have the starting of the engineering and procurement and you know design and installation you know, process across the next 18 months with the expectation that it'll go in 2015. And as you mentioned, provides redundancy for really the beyond design basis events that, uh, that came out of the Fukushima Lessons Learned Task Force. So it is a requirement, as mentioned, uh, coming from the NRC. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? I have a comment. Director McGuire, you did an excellent job explaining that because I had the Thank question you. too, and I think in a public meeting, mm -hmm. uh, it's right. a large amount of money and right. to not go to a public well, process. This is also so I, I asked that in a committee meeting, and, and I'm glad you But I thought yeah. you did a great job explaining the complexity and the uniqueness of it. Thank you. But sometimes we knew the board is like, <laughs> without, without a bid, but totally understandable. We're and talking about safety issues here. Too. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> they, great job explaining that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board members? Any member of the public wish to comment on this? John Pollock, 1412 North 35th Street, Omaha. Uh, is this uh, instrumentation that's intended to operate in? in the event of uh, power failure uh, at the uh, Fort Calhoun plant? Yeah, good question. Again, you know, for the lessons learned from Fukushima, it'll have that level of redundancy and, and independence that uh, that will provide the indications that the operators need in the event we were in a, you know, very, I'll say significant, this beyond design basis type event. Which would include the power failure. That, that, that's correct. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Eric? Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Ulrich? Yes. Weber? Yes. <coughs> Motion carried. Item number six, resolution number 5966. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Illinois <coughs> Public Power District as follows that the engineer's certification requesting that the board waive the sealed bid requirements in accordance with Nebraska Revised Statute, Section 70-637, as amended, is hereby approved, that the district is hereby authorized to negotiate and enter into a contract or contract amendment with Brenwald Mechanical Contractors and Engineers to install a natural gas igniter piping for unit number one at the Nebraska City Station subject to review and approval of the final contract documents by the district's general counsel. And finally, that the notice required by Nebraska Revised Statute, Section 70-637 as amended, shall be published in the Omaha World Herald. So moved. Second. Dr. Weber, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this board action authorizes management to negotiate and enter into a contract to install natural gas igniter piping for the Nebraska City Station unit number one. Uh, this conversion of unit number one burner ignition system will allow plant personnel to fire either natural gas or fuel oil. That will, that's going to provide significant cost savings. As a way of background, this board issued to Grunwald Mechanical Contractors and Engineers a contract 187946 for uh, $750,779 for Nebraska City unit number two natural gas igniter piping installations. That work has been done exceptionally well. It's going to be completed in August. There are significant cost savings and reduced project risk that will be gained by negotiating with Grunwald to perform a similar scope of work on Unit 1 as they are presently doing with Unit 2. Therefore, the sealed bid process is not in the public's best interest. Work on Unit Number 1 is scheduled to be completed in the spring of 2014. So the formal action required is approval by the Board of Directors of the Engineer certi Certification and authorization for management to negotiate and enter into a contract, either amended under contract 187946 or separately with Grunmall mechanical contractors and engineers to install natural gas igniter piping for the Nebraska City Station unit number one boiler. Very good. Any board members have questions or comments? 
thought Dr. Weber did a good job explaining that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to slight you there. <laughs> well, I, Same I, applies. I wondered whether I was going to... Oh. You did a great job. No, I get it, I get it. <laughs> Dr. Weber, I did hear you say that we would have the ability to use, still use number two fuel oil and as a backup. Is that correct? That's I correct. I hadn't picked up on that before. That's correct. So in the event that we would have an unplanned outage or shut down at the unit one while this is under construction, we could still start back up with the old fuel. <coughs> is that right? <coughs> Good. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? And this uh, is similar to what we did in Nebraska City as far as the designated. Is that correct? Yeah. This is just yeah. the other unit. Yeah. While they're already Same there thing. and on site, exactly. already set up. Any questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, please call the roll. Barrett? Yes. Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Ulrich? Yes. Weber? Yes. Barry. Now it's time for our State of the Utility Report. President Gates, please. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, we'll uh, walk through our utility again as, as we normally do. With regard to fuel, uh, the only new item uh, to report is the reopener, which we talked about in the committee meetings for our coal sales. This is the remaining coal that we need for 2014. We did receive four proposals on that. Uh, the lowest and best bid to provide that coal was out of the Cadero Rojo mine, which is in the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. And so we're prepared to execute that contract. With regard to generation, we did have two outages uh, in our fleet. Uh, Nebraska City Unit 1 was removed from service June 25th to repair a furnace leak, and that required a replacement of a failed tube. That was returned to service on June 29th, and North Omaha No. 5 was removed from service June 28th to repair a furnace leak, and that was returned to service on July 4th. June 27th, there was an interesting event at North Omaha Station. Uh, we hosted a lot of utility representatives and vendors for an open house there. The reason for that is that North Omaha was selected as the winner of the PRB Users Small Plant Award of the Year organization, which really requires a lot of effort on, on part of the team. And congratulations, uh, John, to your team on that. The uh, marketing and trading, we continue to use renewable resources at uh, increasing levels. We had 5.6%. Now, that percent number may appear less than what we've reported in other months, but keep in mind the load's up in the summer, so that percent uh, drops by the mathematics. We're still pleased with the capacity overall, it's about 41% on our renewables, mainly wind. And we're continuing to look at uh, new opportunities in all parts of the renewable piece, so we're still, <coughs> still in, the, in the search for anything we can use there. Specifically on Fort Calhoun Station, which does remain cold in cold shutdown, uh, currently the core is offloaded in the spent fuel pool. We anticipate that uh, changing soon as we move to reload the reactor, which is uh, coming very soon. We've re re completed all our testing that's required uh, in preparation for that, particularly our safeguards testing. Uh, many of the systems that are required for plant operation are being returned to service. Our circulating water system, which comes from the river, is in operation, as well as our condensate system, which would feed the steam generators as we move through heat up and operation of the unit has been placed in service. Uh, many of the turbine support systems are being returned to service uh, as we speak here today. An interesting part um, of the startup of Fort Calhoun was a fast cruise training for our operations personnel. And that's where they uh, do actual turnover, spend 12-hour shifts in our simulator facility, and work through op normal operation of the plant. Um, in 12-hour shifts, they relieve each other on those shifts, uh, just like they're operating a plant. I believe the term comes from the Navy, I'm not sure, but uh, it's been, it was a very good experience over about a two- to three-day period and has prepared our operators to, uh, to go back into the operating atmosphere of a nuclear power plant. Uh, the main work we have remaining to core load is completion of the tornado missile protection work, which is ongoing. We're down to about one or two items there that we need to complete. We anticipate that will be done in the next 48 to 72 hours in that time frame, and then we've uh, completed all the checklists that we need to go ahead and start reloading the core with fuel. We have a lot of inspection activities ongoing at Fort Calhoun right now. Uh, we've got a team of 13 inspectors there that are completing the 350 inspection, which is that checklist that we've been working through for the restart of the unit. That'll be a two-week effort um, and uh, maybe some additional inspections after that. And we're moving through uh, many inspections that uh, are required for the restart of the unit. Our focus, though, continues to be the safe operation of that unit, and uh, we will 
we will be satisfied ourselves that the unit is safe before we recommend that startup to the NRC in the future. It's been a very, very busy month in transmission and distribution. Some of you may have been touched by that in this room. On June 24th through the 26th, we had a level one storm uh, go through our <laughs> service area, mainly here in the city. It was a Monday morning about 10 o'clock. We had about 52,000 customers out at the peak, and the crews that uh, went to work there did, did so in, in their normal, uh, very aggressive and good fashion. By 10.30 Monday night, we were down to 13,300 customers. And although it required, it caused a lot of significant wire damage on a one-person basis, you know, the wire that goes into your house was taken out by trees that, that came down. Uh, we did have everybody restored by 11.20 p.m. on Wednesday. We did get mutual aid uh, from NPPD LES and Southern Power District. Now, it's interesting that at the same time we had this storm, we had dispatched crews uh, from June 22nd to the 27th to Minneapolis. Uh, then, because they had 610,000 customers out. So we had crews up there. We left them up there to help Minneapolis and supplemented with some other crews from our area. It's really, to me, a message on the, uh, the way utilities work together and the concept of mutual aid, and, and our crews did a good job in both places. You might have noticed the uh, thank you note from the Minneapolis group in the newspaper uh, this week. In the finance area, we had our, our annual participant meeting. As you know, Nebraska City, too, is jointly uh, participated in by several utilities including OPPD. We, we run it, but uh, several utilities took power from that facility. We had that meeting and provided updates on where we're going with maintenance and other items. We did visit with the rating agencies, both Moody's and Standard & Poor's, on June 27th and 28th, discussed our current operating and financial condition, and, and gave an update on Fort Calhoun Station as well. Had good meetings with them as far as interchange of information, and they will um, reevaluate where we are in our bond rating at the end of August. So we'll wait for that to that meeting to occur. With regard to our customers, we did have 11 open houses to provide our customer owners an opportunity for input into our new stakeholder process, and we'll be providing an update to the board on that in the next month. Uh, we continue to do very well on our industrial safety record um, going forward. This is one of the best years we've ever had in the company as far as uh, protection of our people. And that's, that's a great credit to all the men and women that are out there working, because we do work in adverse weather and adverse conditions. A lot of times when many people are, are in their homes, our people get called to go out and do their work, and they do that safely and, and very well. Just an interesting number, our call center took 7,000 call, calls during the last week's storm, and uh, the new options that we put in there really worked well for, for interfacing with us so we know where the problems are. On uh, really of note, we, did, we have an annual... Um, from our Society of Engineers here at OPPD. And, and OPPD is about 19% engineers as a company. We are a technical company. Uh, we annually look at who our, our engineer of the year would be based on their service and their contribution and their technical de uh, ability. And Chuck Manertak is, has been nominated and accepted as that. He's a principal substation engineer, and he was a recipient of that award this year. Very deserving of it. Uh, he also went to a good school. I was trying to... In Ames, in Ames, Iowa. <laughs> was, uh, good, you cycle. Good, good to know. Yeah. You okay, Dr. Webb? Yes. <laughs> He's working for on a graduate degree at UNO. Uh, but that concludes my report. <laughs> Thank you, President Gates. We now come to the time of the meeting where. Uh, well, before I have any questions okay. for Mr. Gates. Sure. Uh, this, the storm reminded me of something. During the storm, the, after the storm, the World Herald ran a piece on what's the customer's responsibility and what's our responsibility. And I thought we had agreed a long time ago to accept responsibility for the mast down to the meter and not just for the wires once they attach to the mast. And so the World Herald story said, and picture diagrams said that the customers were responsible for the mast. Was that a change in policy or? I don't believe so. Tim, you want to give some further context on that? <clears throat> or was the World Herald wrong? Which I would <laughs> happen all the time. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there's been no change in policy. Uh, the mass has always been uh, part of the uh, meter box uh, that the customer is responsible for. And so when that meter mass pulls from the house, uh, there are many times our folks can move that back and, and 
put it back in its place, and they do that when they're there to restore a service line that may be dropped, but typically that is the customer's responsibility. I thought we had changed that after that family in South Omaha got killed. No, what we changed in that is how we approach those safety incidences with our Project Safe Neighbor, uh, where we will work with a variety of agencies that if a customer cannot be reconnected because of a safety issue on their mast, or in their meter socket, or maybe even internally to their home. We'll work with a variety of different agencies, including um, the uh, Electrical Contractors Association, uh, to find funding and an opportunity for them to repair that um, safety problem. And we can even use our billing process through our Project Safe Neighbor um, uh, kind of uh, practice to put those expenses on the bill for a 12-month period of time. So, We'll visit. Um, now is the uh, time for the public to comment on other items of district business. I want to reiterate uh, what Judge Secretary read at the beginning of the meeting. And please come forward, if those of you who wish to address the board. Good morning. David Corbin, 1002 North 49th Street. Uh, last week I had the opportunity uh, to visit a geothermal plant in Iceland. Uh, yes. <laughs> it just so happened, by happenstance, the same day that I was there, or he's probably saying the same thing, that uh, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, was there and visiting, touring the plant as well. No, he wasn't saying so. Oh, he wasn't? <laughs> okay. Uh, and, the, the, and the reason, uh, by the way, today I'm uh, talking representing uh, Nebraskans for solar. But the reason that he was there, and the reason that I thought it would be interesting to share with you, is uh, Iceland, as you probably know, sits on this wonderful natural resource and has 100% uh, renewable energy for their island, uh, although there's only 300,000 people there. But the take-home message and why the Secretary General was there is that uh, Take advantage of the resources that you have, and especially if they're clean and if they're renewable. So again, uh, urging uh, even more uh, move forward to the those resources that we have, that wonderful uh, wind energy potential that we have, and starting to get more into solar. And I'm looking forward, uh, Nebraskans for Solar will be meeting with Ms. Hutchinson uh, this afternoon, and, and so we're looking forward to that meeting. Thank you. Thank you. John Pollock, 1412 North 35th Street, Omaha. Well, uh, this is the month. We're going to be uh, under a heat dome. Today's our last uh, nice day of near normal temperatures and humidity for quite a while as the heat dome builds over the central part of the country. Uh, interestingly enough, there's a little piece of, uh, uh, I'm going to call it a little eddy that's caught in there that uh, sometimes we call a uh, subtropical wave, uh, which is going to be trying to go retrograde from the eastern U.S. toward our region. Uh, not sure what that's going to do yet. The uh, weather models handle those pretty poorly, uh, especially when they're in the middle of a heat dome. Uh, it may not do much. It may hold temperatures down a little bit while elevating humidity, uh, or it could get us into some monsoon moisture, which otherwise is going to be entering the southwest U.S. and actually emerging over the central Rockies and be directed toward the Dakotas. Uh, if that happens, uh, there'll be isolated uh, thunderstorms with it with a potential for strong winds and heavy rain. Uh, once again, this is the early phase of this uh, development. This is looking out 10 days. As the ground dries out, we'll have conditions quite possibly to enhance that heat dome. So we'll just keep watching that. In the meantime, uh, there's going to be wind energy for a while. We'll see whether that lasts as we get into the middle of the heat dome and plenty of solar energy that's going untapped. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patricia Fuller from Council Bluffs, and I'd just like to finish up on my comments from the last board meeting regarding the uh, North Omaha plant meeting all the current EPA guidelines. Uh, 
while apparently, you know, it's very true and meant to convey reassurance, it actually says very little. To my knowledge, the last major upgrade to the plant was the installation of the electrostatic precipitators back in the late 1970s to deal with the flu ash problem. Also, from what I understand, <clears throat> North Omaha's last Title V permit was uh, updated in 1997 and is one of the most outdated in the country. It'd be impossible for OPPD to violate most emission limits in this permit. <coughs> the permit is so old it does not contain limits on particulate matter, and only one boiler has a nitrous oxide limit, and that limit is very high. For sulfur dioxide, the boilers cannot exceed 2.5 pounds per 1,000 BTU. This averaged over two hours. OPPD may have burned uh, high sulfur coal in the past, but now with its contracts to burn low sulfur coal, it would be impossible for OPPD to violate the 2.5 pound uh, per 1,000 BTU limit because coal from the region, <coughs> the Powder River Basin, generally emits only one pound uh, per thousand BTU. The state law also has a 20 percent opacity restriction that OPPD must meet regarding particulate matter, which to my knowledge uh, was not shown in the permit, which is uh, another reason why that permit should be updated. Uh, North Omaha emits ten times more sulfur dioxide per unit of energy than Mid-American's Unit 4 Council Bluffs. Uh, and although I know this is a much newer plant, if the two plants make the same amount of energy, North Omaha makes ten times more pollution. Now with the new MATS ruling, coal-fired power plants will be uh, required to meet an even more stringent uh, limitation of two-tenths of a pound per thousand BTU if you're choosing the SO2 limit rather than the acid gas limit. And in closing, North Omaha plant emits more mercury than any other plant located in the city the size of Omaha or larger. But OPPD, instead of uh, committing to deal with this mercury problem, has been granted the one-year extension under the MATS ruling. President Gates, would you like to add some context uh, on that? John, yeah, John. just some context on some other improvements we've made at North Omaha and also the dry slogan. Yes, uh, it's correct that we did upgrade the plant back in the mid-70s with the precipitators and lowered our opacity, our particulate by 99% capture uh, <clears throat> in the precipitators. We've also made improvements to the uh, burners on several of the units and put low NOx burners on and reduced uh, NOx emissions since the mid-1990s by approximately 40%. And we did uh, uh, transition to a low, lower sulfur coal, which reduced uh, sulfur emissions by about approximately 40% as well. Uh, currently, we are doing uh, testing on, on Unit 5 uh, with drive sorbent injection and an activated carbon to uh, determine how effective we can be with uh, further sulfur uh, reductions and mercury as well. Thank you. John, mm -hmm. John could you respond to the, the mercury issue that was brought up? Yeah, um, that's something I'll have to look at. I don't have the data at hand okay. on uh, uh, to give a comparison or contrast to the at our next meeting, maybe we can hear about That would be fine. More. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next, please. Yes, I'm Dr. Bobby Davis, 4947 Spalding, Omaha, Nebraska, and I am a 50-year rate payer for OPPD. I have uh, been concerned for some time about the North Omaha emissions, that it, it seems like I don't know if there's not a will or not an understanding or what the problem is on why we're not moving toward uh, not using coal in that plant because of the admissions and because of the health problems that's called, is caused, being caused in North Omaha. Uh, I, I hope you will start that process soon. I know you're looking at ways to reduce emissions, but we need to find ways so that the emissions is down to zero, which means that we would not use coal anymore. We have too many people who are suffering health problems, and we don't, as I said last month, you are about 
taking care of the public, and we want you to now emphasize that more and more. Uh, being a person who has a, a respiratory disease myself, I know what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. My name is Crystal Craig, 7110 South 76th Street, La Vista. And these are my children up here. They live with me. This is Anthony, Adrian, Anderson, Alexandria, and my nephew, Brandon. Um, I thought I would bring them here today to help participate since this is their future. And, you know, they are the ones breathing this air, too. Um, and I prepared something this time ahead of time, so I'll just read through it. My children deserve clean air and water. All children do. The earth is not given to you by your parents. It is loaned to you by your children and your children's children. People have tried asking you nicely for a long time, and now I'm demanding. It is my job as a mother to protect my children. The more educated I am, the angrier I become. I will fight for my children, and I will fight for their future. I will not back down, and I will come with an army. There are that many of us. We will gather, and then you will hear us. You may be hearing these words from one small woman, but they are an echo of the thousands that they represent. In the native culture, they teach their children to think ahead seven generations. The echo that you are hearing is the voice of all my ancestors and the voices of all those who lived on this land before us. The climate is changing at a pace that has been dramatically intensified directly because of human action. I know the science and you know the science. Shut down the coal plant and decommission the nuke plant. Invest in clean energy now. Invest in the future. We must take immediate action if there's going to be a chance for the future of our children. What will you say when they ask you, what did you do about this? Did you know? And you know. In, in your position, you have a great responsibility. And I hope that you will take that and wake up and realize that you cannot put a price on the future. This is bigger than all of us combined, and the time has come. The time is now. We will not stop fighting. We will not go away. We will multiply in number and in strength. You can continue to live in the old, outdated way of thinking. You can continue to squeak by outdated industry standards with outdated equipment. Or you can recognize us as friends and allies in helping to create sustainable, job-creating, clean energy. Thank you for your time. Thank you. John Atkinson, Nebraska Wildlife Federation. Good morning. Good morning. Um, couple of things. Well, three things. First of all, um, that was a wonderful statement. I'm pretty sure if we took it to a vote, uh, uh, certainly my organization would endorse that and stand behind it 100%. Uh, a couple of uh, concrete uh, comments and questions. One on the per kilowatt hour uh, cost of uh, new wind generation uh, versus um, the existing coal-fired uh, generation. I'm hearing it said that on a kilowatt hour versus kilowatt hour basis that wind is now practically head-to-head -head competitive with coal. And I don't know if Mr. Gates would be prepared to address that, but I'd be interested in his opinion. Go ahead. Uh, John, we can get to you afterwards, too, with some of the some details, but uh, it's it's doing better, as we said, and that's why we're investing in the wind. Mm -hmm. And as, as we've discussed before, one of the issues, of course, is the backup that's required, and that's a cost that has to come into to the wind generation piece. But again, we're, we're putting in wind, um, we're looking for new renewables constantly. Um, we're, I think we're a leader in, it, in Nebraska, actually, putting that to, uh, in the wind. And we're doing that because the prices are becoming more attractive. So you're right, prices are coming down. Uh, the actual quality of it, I, to, to give you the, the actual answer, we'll, we'll look it up, see what we got, and give you some, some information on it to the degree we can. Um, some of it is, uh, as we've said before, on like coal contracts, that's a confidential number, but we can give you a sense of what the cost is. I appreciate that. Look forward to it. Um, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's, 
What we're trying to do, and I think that's true of all of us here, is participate in a constructive way um, as uh, public in, in public power. And, you know, we're not trying to grandstand or, or get anything on the record here. We're just trying to validate that our sense of it is that when you look at this one metric, you know, it looks pretty darn good, and we look around at, at other states nearby, and they seem to be able to incorporate a significantly larger uh, share of their, their generation from clean renewable, especially wind, since we're lucky enough, as, as uh, others have pointed out, to be sitting in the middle of one of the best resources in the world. And um, in that line, we'd, we'd really, again, like to say we'd like to see OPPD and, and the other utilities in the state set a goal to dramatically increase the targets for using the clean renewables. Um, it's probably not something we're going to achieve by accident. We probably need to say, yeah, let's go for 30% um, in, in uh, six or seven years and 50% in, in 10 years or something like that, uh, which I think other, other states, we're, we're sort of lucky in a way that other states have blazed that trail and are headed in that direction. <clears throat> Excuse me, so we can use their experience. Uh, one other note. <clears throat> Excuse me. One other note is that you know we 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 keep stumbling across these these little anecdotes, and anecdotes are really only useful if they illustrate a larger trend. And I'm I'm thinking about when there was the bad storm here, and the terrific crews uh, of Nebraska utilities go out and keep us uh, online and get us back online when we're down. And it is absolutely essential that utilities, not just neighboring like NPBD, but going to Minneapolis, all that is very, very essential, very important, and, and uh, the proper spirit to operate in. But I think what the climate scientists have been telling us for some time, and specifically Dr. James Hansen, um, of NASA was telling us last year is that the frequency of these events is profoundly different than it has been in the past. That while what he refers to as the three sigma events, those those what we used to think of as outliers, you know, a fraction of one percent of the Earth's surface might be, land surface might be um, suffering from an extreme event back in the day, now we're looking at like 10%. And if you see that as part of a trend, it's quite alarming. And this anecdote of, well, we were in Minneapolis and then we had a problem here and so we had to draw people in, I, I think that needs to be seen in, in the trend. Uh, as, and, and, and we need to be pre preparing for that because the climate is changing. It's well documented on the, in the scientific literature. Um, politicians don't want to give up on beating that horse, but it's it's done. And I, I just think that you know, one of our jobs is to go around to the utilities and say, you know, don't just look at the last 20 years. Look at the 30-year sequences, the last three or four 30-year patterns, and, because it's going to make our job uh, much more difficult uh, if we don't. I'm sorry, John. I missed the point. Mm -hmm. So, so the trends are changing. Mm -hmm. uh, and and what's your, what would you propose that we do? Thank you. Hire more people, <laughs> uh, because there will be storms irregardless. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm sorry, I missed it. Good. Thank you. Um, you know, there's a um, taken off of an old old advertising theme. Global warming doesn't cause hurricanes and stronger storms. It just makes them stronger and more powerful. Um, that's true of weather in general. I think probably John Pollock can speak to that uh, better than I. Uh, just recently, um, Dr. Kerry Emanuel from MIT uh, made a bold move in his analysis, and he's a, uh, a scientist world renowned for his expertise in climate and hurricanes, and he's saying he's updated his, his uh, level of alarm in number and, and so forth of so that how, particular how kind that of storm. And the, the cause of the climate changes <laughs> is the greenhouse gas pollution. First and foremost, CO2, the largest source of which 
is coal-fired generation of electricity in the United States. And automobiles? No. Oh, okay. Automobiles is non-trivial, don't get me wrong. Um, I think it'll be a wonderful day when we're producing electricity in a clean and sustainable, renewable fashion and convert most of transportation to electricity. Okay, so your point is we need to convert to what? We need to convert to, to wind and solar, other non-greenhouse gas polluting. And the, the other point is... And, and, and at any mm -hmm. expense? Is that what you're suggesting? Only at the expense that's worthwhile to survive and to keep, keep us on an, on an even keel because... Because it, it's, I, I think that when, one of the unfortunate parts of my job is I have to look at this as a layperson, not a scientist, but, but read the papers and, and, and read the basic research to the best of my ability. And it's disturbing and alarming, and I would, I'd love to share that experience with you. Okay, and more with sure. You betcha. Um, you. But, but what I'm saying is that we need to get off the greenhouse gas uh, polluting sources, but also we're stuck with what's in the pipeline. Not only what's here now, but at least a doubling in temperature of what we have now is what I gained from the from the science. So if it's starting to kick off and make weird stuff in more places, weather-wise, climate-wise now, we ain't seen nothing yet. So we just got to prepare. We got it. We get it. Mm -hmm. And I, I do, I think Mrs. Hunterson is going to be meeting with you at the opportunity to meet with her, is that mm -hmm. Next week, that's correct. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. We are giving you that opportunity. To get and I, I appreciate that, that all the public uh, bodies, especially uh, OPBD and LES, are, are open to the discussions. And, and you don't hear uh, from the top levels you know, a, 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 a denying of, of what is scientifically so. So we, we do appreciate it. Thank you. Right on. Elaine Wells, 5005 Reed Street, Omaha, Nebraska. I'd just like to add on to what he was saying. Um, I heard Dr. Henry Pollock, one of the leading uh, climate scientists, maybe five or seven years ago, say that the current weather extremes that we're experiencing now are the result of the pollution that we put into the atmosphere in the 1950s. Obviously, in the last 50 or 60 years, we've added significantly to that pollution. And regardless of what we do, weather is going to get worse. So it's our job, I think, to, as soon as possible, switch from the polluting sources of fuel to the renewables that we have available that are not going to pollute the environment. And we don't have time to waste. We have to do it immediately. Because no matter how, how well we prepare for devastating weather, we're not going to be able to control it unless we stop polluting. Thank you. My name is Laverne Train, 4728 Cass. Before you begin, do you have something to say to Mr. Gates? Yes. I think something was um, said. At last meeting, I made some comments, and people feel like it was a little personal to Mr. Gates. And uh, I apologize for making that personal attack on you. Uh, we had a discrepancy of numbers, and we were talking past each other. I have done research since, since you brought it up. It's not what I came here to talk about, but I'll go into it. From 2003 to 2033, you currently have dedicated 1,690,000,000, 1, <clears throat> just to get that clear, and that's including decommissioning costs. You currently are in violation of not filing the proper decommissioning costs in 2012. I know you've added that into your checklist, but <clears throat> just want to make that clear too. But what I really came here, Mr. Mines, a solution to pollution is efficiency. Purchasing efficiency as your base load is the cheapest way to generate power by not using power. And then after, because every building in the city uses 60 to 80% more energy than it needs to use to perform the exact same tasks. And then after you do an enormous super efficiency job of all the buildings and structures, then you do smart grid. And then you put distributed power on those buildings that use power. Because they're using so much less, solar becomes very effective. There's other fuel cells, there's natural gas, there's a hundred different little systems that you can put on, depending on the factory. And then when you're not using the factory in the weekend, no solar array could be generating power to the community next to it, because everybody goes home and uses power in the weekend. <clears throat> so that's how that works, and that is your path, sir. But my real concern is, I was, I was, I was watching a thing about how to make a sign that will last longer than all written history 
to inform the future populations that the nuclear waste you are stacking along the river is dangerous. They haven't been able to come up with that sign because different symbols and languages mean different things to different people. You are stacking hazardous waste, radioactive waste, next to the river for all time. I feel that's an immoral issue, regardless of the financials and the technicals and the structurals. I think it's wrong. I think you do too. None of us will be here to make those decisions in the future. We cast it upon the children that woman brought in. Thank you and have yourself a wonderful afternoon.